This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Jeff Ratliff with the Neurology Podcast and Thomas Jefferson University. I'm speaking with Eduardo de Pablo Fernandez from the Queen Square Brain Bank for Neurological Disorders at University College London. Eduardo and his colleagues published a paper in neurology published in the June 2024 issue titled Neuropathologic Validation and Diagnostic Accuracy of Presynaptic Dopaminergic Imaging in the Diagnosis of Parkinsonism. In this study, Eduardo and his colleagues examined the associations between neuropathologic diagnosis and striatal dopamine transporter or DAT imaging within a cohort of patients with Parkinsonian diseases such as Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy, and progressive supranuclear palsy. They used this analysis to explore the sensitivity and specificity of DAT imaging for these various Parkinsonian disorders. Eduardo, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So before we get into the details of the study, let's start at a high level with a synopsis of the study and its findings. And so what did this study teach us about the associations between DAT imaging and patients with Parkinsonian disorders and their ultimate neuropathologic diagnoses? So this is a clinical pathological study that we used patients from the Queen Square Brain Bank. So this is the first time that we were able to evaluate the diagnostic properties of dopaminergic imaging with comparing to the gold standard of pathological diagnosis. And the results were quite interesting. It showed in some aspects that uh, dopaminergic imaging can be a, a very useful diagnostic tool in the differential diagnosis of Parkinsonism, and this was particularly true in patients with synucleinopathies in Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy. The results showed high sensitivity and a very high or excellent negative predictive value, particularly in patients with Parkinson's disease, but also very high in patients with multiple system atrophy, particularly those with motor symptoms were predominantly Parkinsonian. Uh, the high um, negative predictive value means that in, in clinical practice, when you have a, a negative result, you're almost certain that you are excluding these conditions. Um, on the other hand, as, as every diagnostic test, um, that imaging comes with limitations as well. And the results were not so good when uh, we evaluated uh, people with Parkinsonian disorders with underlying tau, whether progressive supranuclear palsy or uh, corticobasal degeneration. In these two conditions, that sensitivity was not so high, the negative predictive value was not so high. And also in combination with the suboptimal specificity of that imaging, make the results not so useful in clinical practice for these conditions. And the lack of specificity was mainly due to the presence of different uh, neurodegenerative disorders that in theory they shouldn't have a presina component, but that showed abnormal DAT imaging. This include people with Alzheimer's disease or other conditions under the umbrella term of frontotemporal dementia. So it sounds like four disorders that are attributed to alpha-synuclein mediation, such as MSA or Parkinson's disease, the sensitivity and the negative predictive value of the DAT imaging was strong, but we start to notice that falls apart a little bit when we get into the tau-mediated disorders like corticobasal degeneration and progressive supranuclear palsy. I have you correct? That is correct, yes. And so let's talk a little bit about the patient cohort itself. And so you started from a neuropathological brain bank of patients with confirmed neuropathological diagnoses and then looked retrospectively into their clinical syndromes and the clinical data that was collected during life. And so can you teach us more about these patients who are being studied here? Who was included? Who was excluded? Tell us more about the group of patients we're examining and looking at the DAT imaging in. That is a very important question because each diagnostic test, the validity and the results depend a lot on the clinical scenario where we are testing it. We collected patients with neurodegenerative disorders from the Queen Square Brain Bank. Queen Square Brain Bank is specialized in neurodegenerative Parkinsonisms and dementias. It's one of the largest in the world. So we have a good collection of cases and we identified those who had presynaptic dopaminergic imaging during life. From those, we excluded those who had a clinical syndrome of predominantly dementia or cerebellar ataxia, and we only included those where the differential diagnosis was a Parkinsonian syndrome. 
there is a lot of overlap on these conditions, obviously. So all the cases included had clinical evidence of a Parkinsonian disorder. These cases were or had the dopaminergic scan as part of the workup for their clinical condition. They were seen at uh, clinics in the National Health Service of the UK. And it is important as well to highlight that 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 scan was requested as part of the clinical investigations. They were not done as part of any research study. It probably reflects a bit the type of patient that we can find in the clinics where the differential diagnosis is a bit more challenging. Of those cases, we included in the study a total of 189, and we split the analysis between those who, in theory, may have a presynaptic impairment of the nigrostriatal system, these are conditions such as Parkinson's disease, uh, multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, and corticobasal degeneration. And then all those conditions that had a different pathological diagnosis were grouped together as non-presynaptic Parkinsonism. I think it's important, as you said, we know who we're talking about. And it sounds like one of the key take-homes, or maybe two, are that one, all of the patients had some clinical Parkinsonism as part of their syndrome, even if we're looking at a condition like multiple system atrophy, where there can obviously be cerebellar ataxia as part of that clinical syndrome. All of these patients had some Parkinsonism. And the DAT scans that were analyzed in this case were being ordered in a clinical context. These were physicians or clinicians using a DAT scan to try and better diagnose or better elucidate what was going on with the patients at hand, correct? That's correct, yes. So you did find that dopamine transporter imaging was highly sensitive for MSA and had a strong negative predictive value, acknowledging what we just said about the inclusion of Parkinsonism. So if we're going to advise our listeners on when to think about using dopamine imaging versus perhaps more importantly, not use dopamine imaging in the patient who has autonomic dysfunction and some motor symptoms. I realize you didn't look at patients with ataxia purely without Parkinsonism, but how would you advise clinicians to use DAT imaging in patients where maybe they're thinking about MSA? Is finding and identifying Parkinsonism on their exam really key in that scenario, or, or how would you go about teaching them? Before we get into the analysis of each pathology, I think it's important to remind us what really energetic imaging measures is just the integrity of the presynaptic uh, nigrostriatal systems. It measures the dopamine transporter, which is in the uh, nigral neuron projections into the estriatum. Obviously, this is something that is reduced in mainly in Parkinson's disease, that it was deeply studied there, but it's one of this a specific pathophysiological process, and we are using that as a proxy of the disease. But obviously, this is not pathognomonic, and it can be seen, and it's generally accepted that is the same process in multiple system atrophy and progressive supranuclear palsy, with some questions about corticobasal degeneration that we may discuss a bit more in detail later. So that is used as the proxy to diagnose these conditions with dopamine imaging. Going back to your questions about multiple system atrophy, similar to Parkinson's disease, the sensitivity was very high, but we only included cases, as you said, with MSA Parkinsonian variant and MSA cerebellar variant, but only those who had also clinical Parkinsonism. We did not include MSA cases with pure uh, cerebellar ataxia. I think in answer to your question about the indication of, of that imaging, I think probably it could potentially be a good diagnostic tool that we can use, even if there is no Parkinsonian symptoms or signs uh, on the examination. But I think it's very relevant to interpret those results in the clinical context and be mindful that in a minority of cases, that scan can be normal in those patients with multiple system atrophy presenting with a pure cerebellar syndrome. Yeah, I think that's important that the imaging that we're looking at is very focused on specifically those nigrostriatal projections of that dopaminergic system. And in the absence of Parkinsonism in our MSA context, then 
you're right. We may start to lose out on the sensitivity and the negative predictive value that we emphasized in patients who do have some Parkinsonian features in the cohort that you studied. Now pivoting, I'd like to hear more about patients with a corticobasal syndrome in this group. And so in patients with clinical diagnoses of Parkinson's disease and in a Parkinsonian MSA syndrome, like we just discussed, and even in patients with PSP, the DAT imaging was pretty sensitive, but that was less so the case in patients who are ultimately diagnosed with a corticobasal degeneration on their postmortem neuropathologic testing, where that sensitivity of the DAT scan was not that high. Was this surprising, or does this fit with what we know about the pathophysiologic process of corticobasal degeneration? And again, similar to the last question, what advice do you have for clinicians who are listening about whether or not or how to best utilize dopamine imaging, maybe in patients who have an asymmetric dystonia, or maybe they have an idiomotor apraxia that raises their clinical suspicion for corticobasal syndrome. I think it's important to distinguish here between a corticobasal syndrome, which is the clinical syndrome with the combination of cortical and movement disorder features, and corticobasal degeneration, which is a pathological diagnosis of neurodegenerative disorder due to tau deposition. I think clinical basal syndrome is one of the most challenging um, clinical scenarios. And from our results, I think probably imaging is not going to be particularly helpful. So there is a lot of overlap in corticobasal syndrome with multiple pathologies that can present with similarities under the umbrella of corticobasal syndrome. And the other way around, corticobasal degeneration can have a varied phenotype. In our patients with corticobasal degeneration diagnosed pathologically, we found only that that imaging was abnormal in about 60% of them. It is sometimes difficult to clinically demonstrate Parkinsonism in these patients because, as you mentioned, they can present with a lot of other cortical and motor symptoms and signs that may make the evaluation a bit more challenging. People with a motor apraxia or a stiffness, dystonia of the hand, it is very difficult to demonstrate any true bradykinesia. But I think it is likely that these conditions are affecting different areas of the brain. And it is well recognized that some of these conditions may have a post-synaptic involvement of the negrostriatal system that we are not able to assess with dopamine-transported imaging. And it is likely that in some of these cases who had clinical Parkinsonism with corticobasal degeneration and normal that imaging presented a post-synaptic involvement. In our paper, there is a table where we analyze a bit more in detail those cases where there was a a mismatch between the results of the DAT scan and the pathological diagnosis. And if you look at those cases with a pathological diagnosis of mainly PSP and CBD with a normal DAT imaging and the other way around, those patients with alternative neurodegenerative disorders who had abnormal DAT imaging, most of them presented with a complex Parkinsonian syndrome similar to corticobasal syndrome with a combination of cortical and movement disorders. So I think these cases are particularly challenging and I don't think based on our results that dopaminergic imaging is going to be particularly helpful. And one more point to to make, when you look at the official approval from the regulatory bodies from America, the FDA and Europe, they recommend that imaging and the differential diagnosis of uh, Parkinsonian syndromes, including Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy and progressive supranuclear palsy, but they specifically uh, do not mention corticobasal degeneration. So that's something that we have to bear in mind. So Eduardo, we've talked about the synuclein-mediated disorders, Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy. We've talked about some of the shortcomings in corticobasal syndrome. You mentioned at the top of the interview that disorders that are mediated by tau, which includes progressive supranuclear palsy, were not as robustly evaluated by DAT imaging as the synuclein diseases, PD and MSA. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about what did this study show you about patients who were ultimately pathologically diagnosed with a progressive supranuclear palsy? And what was the utility and the strengths and weaknesses of DAT imaging in those patients in this cohort? So patients with progressive supranuclear palsy showed results somewhere in between corticobasal degeneration and the other synucleinopathies. So the 
sensitivity of DART imaging to detect presynaptic impairment in these patients was not as good as synucleinopathies. And because of that, the negative predictive value of this test in these patients was not as good. So that means that in a considerable proportion of patients with PSP, we will find a normal DAT imaging. And that is going to be independent of this clinical subtype of progressive supranuclear palsy. We try to uh, analyze this statistically to see whether presumably those with a cortical phenotype would have more frequently normal DAT imaging, but that was independent of any motor subtype of, of progressive supranuclear palsy. Again, some message to bear in mind as clinicians that patients with PSP not always have abnormal DAT imaging. I think that's important to note, and PSP is, again, similar to these other conditions. There can be this phenotypic variability in patients ultimately pathologically diagnosed with PSP. But to reiterate what you said and to confirm, when you go back and look at these clinically defined subtypes, it sounds like even across the board, there was not a difference in DAT imaging from one PSP subtype to another PSP subtype to make that distinction, acknowledging that this was a, a secondary analysis and not part of the sort of primary aims of the study, correct? That's correct. Even cases who presented with progressive supranuclear palsy, but a more sort of Parkinson's disease look like phenotype with asymmetric uh, Parkinsonism initially, they could have a normal that imaging at that stage. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important for our listeners that even if they're seeing someone who is Parkinsonian and they're thinking about PSP, that the DAT scan is not going to have that negative predictive value if it returns normal as it would in, in a synuclein mediated disorder. Exactly. If you feel like the clinical syndrome is consistent with PSP, if you have other radiological findings that support that diagnosis, the normal DAT imaging shouldn't put you off making that clinical diagnosis. Yeah. Eduardo, thank you. I think this has really helped our listeners think about the utility and the usefulness and the pitfalls of using DATSCAN in their patients who are presenting with a Parkinsonian syndrome. I've been speaking with Eduardo de Pablo Fernandez from the Queen Square Brain Bank for Neurological Disorders at University College of London. And we've been talking about his paper that was published in Neurology in June 2024 titled Neuropathologic Validation and Diagnostic Accuracy of Presynaptic Dopaminergic Imaging in the Diagnosis of Parkinsonism. Please do check out that article in Neurology. And Eduardo, thank you again for joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.